Uh, hello everyone, my name is Marcin Zegos and I'm representing SIG Autoscaling uh, Group here. First of all, let me explain who we are. SIG Autoscaling is a group of people within the Kubernetes community focusing on reducing the cost of running your clusters. Of course, we cannot negotiate uh, your contract with your cloud provider. We cannot give you discount codes to buy cheaper hardware, we don't optimize your optimize applications either, but we can make sure that you always have just enough instances of your applications, they are properly sized, and that the computing power provided to run those applications tightly fits their needs in other ways that you are not wasting resources and at the same time, your applications are not overloaded. But having just enough resources doesn't only improve your efficiency. It also helps with the ease of de uh, deployment, development, and reliability, as your environment will adjust to the changes made to your applications. SIG Autoscaling owns a bunch of components that can help you to execute on mentioned goals. During this presentation, I will very briefly explain what these components do, so that, so that the people who came here for some introductions get it, and then I will describe what are the newest developments there. The first component I want to talk is Horizontal Pod Autoscaler. Horizontal Pod Autoscaler is based on metrics that express the load and that the application gets. It can be either some real CPU usage or something more custom like the number of queries per second on, or other gouge like uh, value provided by the user. HPA takes this value, uh, takes the value of this metric, compares it with the user defined target and depending on this comparison adds or removes replicas, hoping to move the metrics towards the desired value. Let's take a look on how does it work in practice. Here, the metric will be utilization, understood as the ratio between the actual CPU usage of a pod and the amount uh, of CPU that the pod requested. As you can see, we have uh, here four pods that are qu getting quite a bit of traffic. They are using around 90% of the request and if the traffic increases, they may not have enough resources to handle the requests. However, if we add yet another application replica, then the load will spread across more instances and the average per pod utilization will get lower and will be closer to the desired target. If the situation is opposite and we have many instances that are not that much utilized, removing one of them will move the average per pod utilization closer to the desired target. And that is what horizontal pod autoscaler does. HPA has been around for uh, quite some time. We reached uh, stable version V2 back in late 2001, 2021. <laughs> it means that with the accordance with the API deprecation policy, the beta versions are about to be removed. V2 beta 1 was removed in 1.25 and V2 beta 2 will be removed in 1.26. If you are still using the old definitions of HPA, please update them as soon as possible because with your next uh, cluster update, they may stop working. In 1.26, we finally made the controller multi-threaded. It's quite embarrassing that it took us that long, but anyway, here it is. Increasing concurrency will help you with dealing with large number of HP objects, especially if you are using custom metrics as obtaining those is really time consuming. Uh, some users are heavily oversubscribing their cluster and use targets above 100% of utilization. Up to 1.26, we were prone to some corner case use, uh, issues but with 126, uh, this problem should now be fixed. We still hope to finally land scale to zero support for custom metrics in the API uh, with 1.26 and uh, post 126, we are planning to have a dry run mode which will allow you to test, you, uh, test your HPA with uh, different metrics without actually actuating uh, the changes. Okay, HP is about uh, autoscaling a single deployment, or to be precise, an object that exposes a scale sub-resource. 
The API uh, allows only to provide a single target. What if you have a more complex use case? Well, and then you have a problem, a problem that you share with other Kubernetes users, like how to ensure more or less equal spreading of pods in free zones of a region. How to guarantee that in case of a zonal failure, pods will automatically go to the other zones and move back when the zone is back online. How to split pods, let's say in 70-30 ratio between spot VMs and regular on-demand VMs. How to make sure that pods consume the nodes with negotiated rate first, and then if they are not enough, we'll go to the others. And how to make all of these deployments horizontally and vertically auto-scaled, and make sure that they work great with a cluster autoscaler? Well, so far, there was no good answer to these questions. So we decided to provide uh, some solution to the problem. Uh, as I see, we are bringing uh, a new tool, a new controller, and a new CRD-based API. The central element of this API will be called um, balancer. The balancer object will have pointers to multiple deployments or anything that uh, exposes this mentioned scale sub-resource. Each of these deployments may have a different node selector, different tolerations, possibly even different configurations. But what they have in common is that the pods from these deployments build kind of one service or one application. Balancer main task will be to properly size these uh, deployments. Each balancer will have a placement policy according to which it will distribute replicas across its target. For example, with the proportional policy of 70-30, it will distribute a, a 10 replicas like this. Seven will go to the first one that runs on spot and three to the other one that runs on regular on-demand VMs. Okay, now what if the cloud provider runs on spot instances and start to preempt uh, virtual machines on which these seven pods are uh, running, as a result, killing the pods? Well, after a configurable um, uh, timeout, Balancer notices that the instances on preemptible nodes are not going back and increases the size of the second deployment in order to account uh, for replicas that are failing on the first deployment. And it will still keep uh, the first deployment at size seven. Why? Chances are that are, you are running a cluster autoscaler. In case of cluster autoscaler, it will keep on trying to bring nodes for those seven pods targeted at spot instances. Eventually, it will succeed and the nodes will be provided and the pods started there. And the balancer will decrease the number of replicas in the second deployment. And the whole thing will be in the desired configuration again. If you want to autoscale the uh, deployments, you point your HPA at the balancer. Balancer exposes the very same scale uh, sub-resource as individual deployment, so it will work out of the box with horizontal pot autoscaler and vertical pot autoscaler. So, what is the status of Balancer project? We reach uh, an agreement uh, about the API within six. The code is almost done in the Google internal repository. Yeah, Google initially wanted to start it on GKE first, but changed their mind in flight, and it will be open source in November, assuming that all of the open source code re reviews will go smoothly. Uh, so we expect the initial release sometime uh, this year. The next thing that Seek Autoscaling owns is a Vertical Pot Autoscaler. Vertical Pot Autoscaler helps uh, you to get the pot size right. It is based on actual historical resource usage of the pods. It looks at CPU memory usage and pays attention to out-of-memory events. It recommends the pod, or actually its container sizes, to keep the real usage within the uh, requested capacity. So, if a pod is using something like 95% of its current request, and maybe even occasionally going above 100, VPA will increase the post slash container size. In the, if the situation is opposite, it will decrease the pod size. Uh, vertical pod autoscaler has also been around for a while. 
Uh, but despite that, SIG managed to make a couple of important improvements. The biggest one is probably the ability to have multiple recommenders running at the same time. Each recommender, which recommends what should be the pod size, may have a different configuration or even a completely different algorithm. And you can decide which one to use by providing its name in the VPA object specification. To support this feature, you can now provide the percentiles used by the standard VPA recommender. Uh, while the default 90 percentile plus a little bit of buffer works for quite a lot of user, you may want to increase uh, this should your workload be uh, more spiky or, and you care about uh, latency or maybe decrease it if you want to oversubscribe your nodes more. Soon, we hope to have an ability to keep a fixed ratio between a CPU and memory. We want to limit the direction of the updates so that, for example, uh, containers and pod only scale up. And we really, really hope to have this Kubernetes in place pod updates landed, and then we will use it in VPA uh, so that it doesn't restart your pods while performing the updates. The last component I would like to uh, talk is Cluster Autoscaler. Cluster Autoscaler ensures that your pod always have uh, a place to run. It provides new nodes for the pods that could not be scheduled and removes nodes that are not that needed anymore. It doesn't use any metric. It uses pod declared requests and a lot of scheduling simulation to tell what would happen if some uh, actions uh, were made. Let's take a look at uh, this in more detail. Here, we uh, have four nodes with pods. If a new pod arrives, it can be placed on the third node. But if the situation is different and all nodes are kind of busy, then the green pod has no place to go. The scheduler marks it as unschedulable. Cluster Autoscaler waits for the signal. It makes some simulation and notices that if one extra node was added, then the green pod could go there. So it talks to, to your cloud provider and resizes the cluster accordingly. The new node shows up and scheduler places the pod right there. And let's take a look at the different setup. Here we have two nodes that are not used to its full capabilities. But if we move the green pod to the third node, then the fifth node could be uh, deleted without any problem, lowering your cloud bill. So uh, what's new in Cluster Autoscaler? The biggest change is making the scale down process faster. It includes better handling of pending pods that don't block scale down anymore. And most importantly, ability uh, for cluster autoscaler to, scale, uh, to handle multiple node drainings or migration at the same time. Previously, cluster autoscaler could delete uh, only could delete empty nodes in bulk, but if nodes were not that empty, like on the examples that I showed you before, it had to migrate pods from them, handling only one node at a time. With the changes uh, that we are making uh, to the scale down algorithm, we hope to get significant scale down speed up and more savings for you as the unneeded nodes will go away faster. We are expanding the pluggability of Cluster Autoscaler by allowing you to have both gRPC Cloud Provider and Expander. We'll talk about gRPC Cloud Provider in a moment. And uh, we are working on better clouds, uh, better batch support uh, use cases by integrating Cluster Autoscaler better with Job and Q that has been mentioned like uh, a bit before on SIG scheduling. Uh, updates. Uh, so, as I said, we wanted to tell you uh, more about the gRPC cloud provider, but unfortunately, Diego, the author of the change, could not be here in person, so I have a video of him instead. So let me play it for you. Hello, I'm Diego Bonfigli, S3 at SysDig, and with this presentation, I will talk about the new gRPC cloud provider. So this is a plugin system to implement cloud providers as a separate process from the cluster autoscaler. First, let me do a small refresh on what a cloud provider is in the context of the cluster autoscaler, or CA from now on. The cluster autoscaler adds 
nodes when pods cannot fit on the current Kubernetes nodes, or remove nodes when resources are underutilized. The logic behind these scaling decisions are common for any environment, but at the end, the CA needs to interact with the specific underlying infrastructure, like create a new host, remove a VM, give me the list of the current instances, and so on. And this is done by calling APIs for the specific cloud provider where the cluster is running. The cluster at scaler supports many cloud providers, I think at the moment almost 30, and the specific implementation for each cloud provider is coded in the cluster to scaler itself. It is abstracted by a couple of Golang interfaces and runs in the same process of the cluster to scaler. So here, in the context of a cl um, cluster to scaler, a cloud provider is the specific implementation that lets the cluster to scale talk to the cloud provider APIs. What do you need to do at the moment if you are a cloud provider and you want uh, the cluster to scale to work with your services? You need to fork the cluster to scale code, implement a couple of Golang interfaces with your custom logic, which most probably makes use of specific cloud provider APIs, and you have to change some pieces of code to integrate your cloud provider. If then you want to contribute back to the community and you want your fork to be merged back to the official cluster at scale, you must respect some rules, like you cannot add new dependencies at top level vendor. I mean, in the go.mod file of the project. And this is because of the problem with version conflicts in transitive dependencies. They are hard to understand and create problems with uh, version upgrades. And then, of course, you have to wait for a member of the Kubernetes organization to review your code if you are not an official maintainer. You can understand that uh, it could be useful to have a pluggable cloud provider, something external to the cluster of the scalar core that implements only the things specific to a cloud provider and leaves the core logic, I mean the scaling decisions, on the cluster of the scaler. With the cloud provider logics moved to a different service, then there is no need anymore for a fork of the ACA. If, of course, you cannot implement uh, uh, your cloud provider as an official cloud provider in the project itself. And this is good because uh, uh, it simplifies maintenance. I mean, the maintenance of forked projects is not always straightforward. For example, you need to keep track of upstream updates, you need to integrate them, and then you need to carefully vet them to understand if new dependencies break your uh, fork. Also, now you can release new versions of your cloud provider whenever you want, without waiting for a new official CA release. You can use libraries that you could not use before, for example, because they are not under the Apache license. And you can also use your own language of choice if you want to avoid Golang for some reason. This is no difference from many other Kubernetes components that are now structured as plugins. Think of the CNI, the container storage interface, the cluster API for provider implementers, and so on. The cluster to scale now has a new plugin system for cloud providers. So now you can build out of three cloud providers. If you use it, the cluster to scale retains all the core logic for scaling, but the specific piece of code for a cloud provider is served by a separate service over the network. The communication between the CA and the external cloud provider service is performed via gRPC. Technically, the plugin system is yet another in three cloud provider. This new cloud provider, called external gRPC cloud provider, implements the Golang interfaces like all the other in three cloud providers, but then it actually wraps these function calls and send them to an external service via gRPC. So the core CA 
takes the part of the gRPC client here, an external crop provider service acts as the service server. Sorry. Okay, we have a pluggable system, and now we want to use it. Let's talk about what you need to do to create a new cloud provider using this plugin system. Let's digress for a moment on some general requirements that all cloud providers need to meet, both in three cloud providers and the new out of three ones created with the plugin system. First, in the cluster auto scaler, there is a concept of node groups. To scale, the CA works with groups, no single nodes. This means that when it needs to add nodes, the CA actually choose a group to scale up. So it is important that all nodes within a group have the same machine type, same labels, same things, and in this are in the same availability zone for the CA to properly decide which group to pick. This does not mean that if a cloud provider does not provide node groups APIs, then it cannot be integrated in the CI. For example, your implementation can, can fake those groups, but it helps. When now scaling instead, the CA deletes specific nodes in the node group. So a cloud provider must provide a way to delete a single node and also resize the group at the same time. And also for this to work, there must be a way to correlate a Kubernetes node to the actual host of the cloud provider. And usually um, there is a node field for this called provider ID, uh, where cloud providers add information to correlate Kubernetes nodes to cloud provider hosts. All these requirements I said are important because if you want to create a cloud provider, you will need to implement APIs that assume these concepts. You can see a summary of RPC's APIs on the left here. The protofile has docs describing what single RPCs and messages are used for. So to write a cloud provider as a plugin, pick your language, create a gRPC server that implements that protofile, write the logic for your cloud provider that most probably will in turn perform calls to the cloud provider itself, and expose the server. It is very important to use MTLS for this, even if you can switch it off for development purposes, because if you look at the RPCs, you are essentially giving the permission to create and delete nodes in your cluster to whoever is able to connect to this server. So please use uh, MTLS in production environments. So we now have a nice way to decouple cloud providers from the core CA. Here I report some things to know before using the plugin system. One thing to take into consideration is performances. On an in three cloud provider, calls are of course local and so they are as fast as they can get. With external gRPC cloud provider, calls now go over the network. Caching for RPCs has been implemented everywhere possible, of course, but still at the moment the plugin system is not has not been tested yet for very large clusters. Think cluster with thousands of nodes. So take this into account. Another thing to know is the external gRPC cloud provider has slight differences on some function with respect to in three cloud providers. Keep in mind that if you want to scale from zero in a group, meaning groups with zero nodes, in some specific, specific circumstances, when you have mirror pods, the calculation performed by the CA to understand if a pending pod would fit in a new node could not be correct. It could be slightly off because the information about the full pods, pods for a node uh, are not in the gRPC cloud provider. Another minor thing to know is that the function get resource limiter is not available, but its use is really limited and almost no cloud provider implements it anyway. And don't be confused by some missing functions. 
in the product file with respect to the Golang interfaces, because some functions are indeed deprecated in the class in Golang interfaces, and so have not been implemented as RPCs here. Okay, uh, we are at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you want to dig deeper here, uh, there are some links. You will be able to download uh, these slides online, so you will be able to uh, look at the links. That's it. I hope this presentation was useful and that you will use this new plugin system. Thank you for your time. Okay, so our presentation is slowly going to an end, so I would like to give you some more details uh, about SIG Auto Scaling if you have uh, some ideas for improvements, questions, comments, or you want to contribute. So we have meetings every Monday at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Detroit time uh, on Zoom. Uh, we have a Slack channel on well, standard Kubernetes uh, site, and most of our uh, code sits in Kubernetes slash uh, autoscale repository. And I would like to thank you for coming this late in the presentation and showing up. That was really, really amazing. That's, uh, and now is the time uh, uh, for questions. Yeah, I have a question regarding the vertical uh, power auto scaler. So, uh, does vertical auto support the custom matrix, like example of data dock, right? So does it supports? Uh, sorry? Data dog metrics on the VPA? The external metrics for the... Uh, VPA, does it support external metrics? Yes. Uh, no, it doesn't support, but if you uh, modify the uh, recommender to pull this metrics from your uh, data site, it, it, the rest of uh, the environment will be okay with it. So if, uh, you, if you want to have external metrics, you you'll need to to uh, contribute some, some code. Oh, okay, so we have to use like just regular metrics. Uh, metrics. So uh, metrics it server. gets metrics from a uh, metric server and okay. st uh, stores them uh, mm -hmm. as a histogram locally in TCD, so we've got a snapshot. However, if you wanted to use uh, something else, some other source, uh, then uh, you need to do it by yourself. There is there's some, uh, code around for getting the metrics from Prometheus, I can probably point you to, uh, to it. Yeah, I have another question regarding cluster autoscaler, right? For example, in the cluster autoscaler, for minimum we put like four nodes, a maximum equal to 10 nodes, and yeah. uh, four nodes are using around 80%, but we put the threshold as 70%. If it is 70% less than that, the, the uh, remove the node, right? So four nodes are using around like 80% and the fifth node is using around 30%. So how does the cluster autoscaler like behaves? Is it, it will delete the fifth node or it will try to move those like? So as long as all your pods are uh, scheduled, it will do nothing. So it okay. will uh, pack your nodes completely mm -hmm. as long as uh, the pods fit there. Mm -hmm. If the pod cannot be fitted to your node and scheduler marks the pod as unschedulable, mm -hmm. then cluster autoscaler kicks in, analyzes your cluster, analyzes what uh, is your configuration, and checks whether adding new node will help. Uh, okay. it, adding new uh, node usually helps, but if you uh, mistype, for example, pod size, and you put 400 mm -hmm. instead of 400 millicores, then obviously uh, your cloud provider would probably be unable to provide you a node with 400 CPUs and well, Cluster Autoscaler doesn't even try to do anything. Thank you. Um, did you consider a CRD based solution instead of the gRPC um, solution yeah, for uh, for, cus for yeah for the cluster autoscaler for the um, providing support for different clouds. Uh, CRD so a uh, cluster autoscaler does a lot of uh, uh, simulation and it invokes a lot of calls to see what if 
well, what if we added that node? Uh, what if we added another node? So it treats scheduler a little bit of uh, like a black box. So it doesn't uh, look closely what is in pod specification. It just uh, shows it new nodes and checks whether scheduler will put it or not. Okay, uh, so doing it with CRD is either impossible or will tele uh, take ages to do communication via API server. Yeah, so um, regarding the, the instance types available on the cloud providers, uh, right now everything is uh, hard-coded into the, into the cluster autoscaler code and it has to be maintained. So for example, let's say I'm using AWS and AWS releases a, a few instance, a new instances that I want to use. Cluster Autoscaler is not going to have support uh, until somebody actually patches that into, into the code. Have you considered uh, automated ways to actually call the providers uh, to get the information about the instance types that are available, number of cores, memory, etc., so that you don't have to depend on this manually updated list? So it is up to cloud provider implementators, so someone who coded it, how to handle it. So on GKE, we have uh, this process automated, uh, but other cloud providers are, well, for some reasons, not, not adding this type of support. If you are interested, please feel free to contribute to the cloud provider that you are running on and will definitely accept those types of patches. So they are not like, uh, uh, again, getting uh, current configuration, current setting and so on is more than welcome, but well, uh, sometimes people implement uh, the cloud providers in a simple way and we cannot force them to uh, have it working better. I wasn't aware that the GKE was automatic, so it's... Yes, yeah, so the GKE uh, uh, creates uh, automatically uh, notebooks if uh, you configure uh, node auto-provisioning. Uh, for the cluster autoscaler, um, we've seen no scale down um, when there's one pending pod, scaled up to a couple of hundred nodes, no scaling down for one pending pod. You said that has changed in 124? Yes. Um, does that mean that you just completely ignore pending pods, or is there only pending pods that are marked as unschedulable uh, or... Uh. So uh, we analyze uh, uh, cluster more carefully and we are checking whether uh, um, removing nodes will not, the make, will not make the life of this pending port harder. Mm -hmm. So if it's like completely independent and uh, this port has no chance to run on this node that we are removing anyway, then we, we are okay with, with removing it. However, we uh, keep uh, we don't scale down if well, scheduler has not yet managed to uh, uh, process the pod and the pod is likely to benefit from those nodes being around. But for instance, the case that I've got one pending pod left and I've got a hundred unused nodes, then yeah. in the current version, you do not scale down any node. You leave that a hundred nodes. Has that yeah, changed? That, that's, that is fixed. That is fixed. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have, if no other questions, um, node groups. Uh, Carpenter is uh, a different kind of autoscaler. They've completely dropped the whole idea of node groups. Mm -hmm. um, has that been given thought for the cluster autoscaler? Or? Uh, so, yeah, it, uh, we were thinking about adding it. So why do we have node groups? It is because uh, Kubernetes in early version was running on node groups and we have, we are having cluster autoscaler since I don't, 2016 or something like that. And most of the cloud providers operate with the concept of node group, node post, autoscaling group or what, whatever. Uh, the second thing is uh, in order to scale up a cluster, we need to know what uh, the new node would look like. You can either have this knowledge uh, be inferred from the existing nodes uh, uh, and, um, or you need to hard code it. So you can uh, uh, get rid of uh, this whole concept and bring new nodes if you hard code a lot of code 
and that uh, figure out what would be the good node for that particular uh, pod, what is the uh, cloud offering, what uh, nodes are supported, what are their prices so that you uh, don't get like the most expensive one and so on. So a lot of uh, very, very cloud specific code that needs to get in. And uh, that may work if you have a group of uh, developers that are uh, set to that particular project of bringing up uh, this hard code to autoscaler and they are maintaining it, keeping it up to date and so on. However, if we have uh, 30 cloud providers starting from AWS to some uh, that you barely have heard about, that's uh, not a valid request to ask everyone to code uh, that complex logic into their cloud provider. We wanted to have more or less uniform uh, experience across the cloud. And cluster autoscaler mostly works the same on Azure, uh, GKE, AWS, and some other clouds you haven't heard probably about. And yes, on uh, GKE, we had um, we made this effort of coding uh, a feature that we called node auto-provisioning. So it creates a new node pool for you should the uh, node pools that you have in the cluster were not enough, like uh, were too small or didn't have the requested GPU. But that's a lot, a lot, really a lot of cloud specific code that even if we open source, it would be hard for the other uh, cloud uh, provider authors to benefit from because they will need to do the very same uh, coding but specific to their cloud providers. So for that reason, cluster autoscaler is like it is. If you want Carpenter experience, then please come to GKE. And if you, someone wants to devote their time to uh, coding, uh, providing this not auto provisioning experience to other cloud providers, we are very happy to give you support and tell how to do it in Cluster Autoscaler. But the warning is that, well, it requires quite a bit of, of work to get it done properly. Yeah, so AWS has chosen to just do it in Carpenter. So that's Sorry? AWS has chosen to just do it in Carpenter. So that's, uh, they, they've created yes, Carpenter. Yes, that's uh, they chosen. They put engineers on it. And well, in theory, Carpenter is open source, but it will um, take a lot of effort in order to make it work on other cloud provider because they need to implement this whole logic that is very, very specific to cloud provider and knows all the uh, way you create the cluster, how you expand the, uh, it, how, uh, how is it built, what, what's the offering, what... Uh, how, the, how to create new nodes and, and what they would look like. Like a, lo a lot of code. I will uh, keep finger crossed for Carpenter, but it will be hard for them to replicate it on other cloud providers. So the Cluster Autoscaler is aware of node groups and has some awareness of cloud providers. For the HPA and the VPA, um, is there any like talk in the community of SIG auto-scaling about adding some support. And the reason I ask is because you may have um, a heterogeneous set of nodes that your application is running on. And because HPA, or sorry, because VPA provides a single recommendation for CPU and memory, um, it may not fit all of your nodes that your application is running on um, with the same request. So I'm just I'm just wondering if there is any discussion there about uh, fixing that, or so uh, the question is about uh, uh, integration of uh, workload controllers with cluster autoscaler or how to run your workload in heterogeneous uh, environment. Yeah, the latter. How to run your workload? So I guess I guess either you know you could you could run your workload in a different way such that you're only running on a certain node group, or VPA could have per no group recommendations? I guess that's kind of my question. Okay, so running uh, your uh, workload on significantly different nodes will cause you problems because the application on one node may run uh, orders of magnitude faster than the other, mm -hmm. and that will confuse horizontal pot autoscaler what is actually going on. So uh, you can run uh, your application on nodes that don't differ that much. Probably we can handle like 10% of performance differences without any problems. But if you, the other node is like three times uh, better, 
than the other, then uh, historical data gathered by vertical pot autoscaler will not be valid. Uh, HPA will be confused whether you are above or below the target and whether it should uh, give you more replicas, uh, less replicas. It may actually shrink your replicas and leaving one that is on this poor node, super overstraining and causing uh, some type of errors for customers. So uh, at this moment, running uh, workloads on very heterogeneous uh, nodes is rather not recommended with auto-scaling, and probably even with auto-scaling too, because, well, you need to size the pods somehow, and the sizes will be different for different types of nodes. Okay, got it. One last question here. Sorry, this might be kind of a noobish question. In terms of HPA, we're currently utilizing it pretty well, but VPA is fairly new to us from a usability perspective. When it comes to HPA, um, a lot of GitOps pipelines, such as Flux, in terms of replication, come into a problem of like three-way merges, where like Flux will give a static uh, replica count, and HPA will give a dynamic or different replica count, and you'll get like a change has already been applied, please try again later error on some signs. Do you, does that same issue ever occur on a VPA perspective in terms of requests and limits uh, that you know of, or has it ever been reported at all? Sir, I'm afraid I didn't understand your question. Oh, my fault. So, so for things like Flux, um, when applying a specific workload or configurations, typically what ends up happening is um, the actual um, GitOps approach of applying a static replica account in terms of like a sync uh, from a GitOps repository will apply a static replica, say one or two. HPA um, will scale that number dynamically via the deployments API to let's say three or four, depending on capacity or uh, usage. But um, what ends up happening sometimes is a three-way merge problem where uh, Flux will keep attempting to reapply two or reapply a lower number than what HPA represents. I'm wondering if the same thing happens with VPA at all, with vertical pod autoscaler, with um, requests and limits specifically? Because I know what Flux specifically ended up doing to mitigate that was to ignore the replica count. So I'm wondering if that's something that other providers have uh, done. So uh, regarding updates in a vertical pot autoscaler, vertical pot autoscaler doesn't update your deployment. It de updates pods uh, uh, in the admission phase. Oh, we, I see, I see. we didn't do it because uh, updating a uh, deployment will cause pot recreation. Uh, and it's not necessarily the thing that you would like to have at the moment. VPA has a couple of operating modes. So you can have it uh, have only recommendations without any actuation. That's for your information. You can see what would uh, uh, VPA uh, give to your pods and uh, apply it manually or well, completely ignore. I see. Uh, other option is to have it only on creation time. So uh, VPA gives you recommended size when the pod is created, however, doesn't uh, touch existing pods. So if something is running, it's running fine. We don't touch it even if we wanted to give a little bit more uh, CPU. And the third mode is automatic when we uh, update pods if they are outside of the uh, reasonable values for pod sizes. So not only if they are a little bit different from the recommended value, but different so that we think that it's worth to update them. And even then, we respect things like pod disruption budget, and we uh, try to do it slowly. On GK, we also have the integration with cluster autoscaler. Uh, updating pods uh, uh, in Updating sizes in deployment will ignore pod disruption budget and cause like immediate uh, rollout of the new version, which will be quite uh, disruptive and definitely more disruptive than uh, our current process. So well, yeah, if you uh, are running VPA from time to time, you should update your uh, deployment so that if VPA is idle, for some reason not running or you have uh, want to have some idea what would be the size of the deployment if created, and you should put it, uh, take the values from VAP object and put your uh, put those in the deployment. Gotcha, so to reiterate, it only messes with the pods from the deployment. Yeah, it messes the pods, leaving deployments 
uh, it's just a long story. I see. That provides a lot of context. Thank you.